Equilibrium team. It feels so good to actually say it in a cohesive type of way. Uh, we're building the first digital family office. So you might ask, what the heck does that even mean? Uh, well, if you come to our calls, you'll realize that there's a lot more ways to make money than just being in traditional equities. So we view ourselves as a solution that gives somebody a managed portfolio, diversified private market investments. Um, and as ETA likes to think about a substitute for income that doesn't necessarily rely on non existent bond yields. So if you think this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, you can always heckle me, you can always heckle Etai, or you can just visit uh, our website, which is equilibriumventures.com to learn a little bit more. Uh, we definitely like hanging out with all of you guys. So that's my little spiel. And now we're gonna give it over to Etai, who's gonna teach you everything about 2020. And it's important. It's important that look, hey, we had, uh, we had a really interesting year last year. And in those times when the markets are, selling off and you get hit, that's a great time to learn and a great time to take away, uh, you know, important things for the next time around when it happens. So uh, Itai, take it away. Sounds good. So let me start this right off. And how well do you think you know 2020? So 2020 has been one hell of a year for the record books in many, 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 um, different things, asset classes, et cetera. So I just wanna go into a few of those highlights. Retail investors have performed hedge funds in 2020. Can anybody guess by how much? 50%, 20%, 100%, or 1,400%? I'm, I'm, going, I'm going C here, Itai. I think they, uh, I think they, I think they beat them pretty, pretty well. Okay. Looks like a lot of people are thinking A. Rob's thinking C. Uh, we got some Bs in the mix. Nobody, no Ds, nobody's failing. All right, Itai, it's time. What's, what's the verdict? What, what actually happened? It is a factor of 14X. We're in the Robin Hood market. Hedge fund managers oh. know nothing. The S&P 500 versus the hedge fund index versus the favorite retail investors. In the year of Tesla and SPACs, what else do you expect? How is it that, 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 that hedge funds got beat literally that bad? That was, that was a misleading question, I object. <laughs> you object away, why do, you, why do you feel that way? Because it made it sound like they made 1,400% or something, but you're just saying the other people made like 8% and the other people made 100%. Right. It's, it's, a relative, it's, a rel it's a relative performance question. What is the, the factor of alpha that they've had over uh, hedge funds? Shame on you, Itai. I hey, apologize. Look, what, what, what's, what's the quote? Statistics don't lie, statisticians do. So it's not necessarily a lie, but Itai is trying to help you kind of see how things did stack out. It was a very, very big win for the Robin Hood market this year. And we'll go a little bit into uh, how that happened. Okay, a little bit about COVID as we know we're kind of moving away from it right now. Uh, based on 2020 estimates, how many people are going to get vaccinated for COVID every minute in 2021? And real quick, is this in Israel or is this across the globe entirely? Israel's already vaccinated, so. Are they fully vaccinated already? There's like, there's like 2 million out of 8 million people already vaccinated. Mm, okay, so it's only 25%. So we have people saying D, D, D across the board. And D is correct. Oh. What, is, what is interesting, there'll be a billion one people vaccinated and all of them will be pretty much in the developed world. Um, the US and the EU are hoarding most of the vaccines with India actually having a decent amount at 1.6 billion. Interesting. So you're saying in the developed world, you're throwing, you're throwing <laughs> India into that? No, I'm just saying the developed world pretty much hoarded the vaccine. India is the only exception, really, uh, plus Indonesia here. Um, why, why is it that the U.S. purchased so many if uh, that it like so exceeds our population? Yeah. So we can so we can sell it afterwards to other countries for more money. I don't believe that, but OK. <laughs> yeah, that was a bit overkill. U.S. only 300 something million. It's true. It's true. It's good to, I think a part of it is the U S literally has enough printed dollars that they were able to 
buy various types of vaccines because they didn't know which one is going to be first yet. And then a bunch of them became um, approved vaccines. All right, a little bit about economics. So we've chosen the UK here. The UK has a long history. Um, so the pandemic plunged the UK economy into one of the deepest recessions in all of history. GDP is down over 11% in 2020. When was the last time the UK economy dropped by more? 1709, the Great Frost. That was a time where it snowed in London in August. 1815, 1918, or 1931. It, this Great Frost, is this kind of like the equivalent of winter came to Westeros and they needed to, Pretty much. to fight off these something uh, to do with the zombie volcano. armies from, from the north? Had something to do with a volcano erupting in Indonesia or something like that and basically covering the sun. Can I just give you a quick story about that? One time I actually was in Bali, Indonesia and a volcano went off and I got stranded in Bali for a week. And it really wasn't that bad because I had no job and of all places to be stranded, it really wasn't that bad. So just putting it out there. Okay, answer is the ice age, the great frost, 1709. This nice little picture of Boris Johnson there. Wow. You can see all throughout the history of the booms and busts. The American War of Independence didn't really do much for the British economy. Panic of 1825, Spanish flu right there, 08, and COVID, uh, one of the greatest disasters to have ever hit the UK. And Itai, just why was that so bad? Just so that people can actually get a takeaway from it? Well, it's mainly a lot of lockdowns and you know a forced shutdown of the economy. So a lot of it is forced. Oh, I was talking about why it contracted so heavily. In yeah, that's, that's, that's primarily the reason. Uh, but the recovery is going to be pretty, pretty vicious as well. All right, leading us to how many times did global central banks cut interest rates in 2020? 60, 125, Ooh. 175, or 190? <coughs> Itai, I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with C on this one. 175. Okay. This is all. It's, okay. it's a very it's a guessing game. So it's it's actually 190 times. And to the right here, you can see the global negative yielding debt. We're currently sitting at approximately 17 trillion dollars of negative bearing bonds around the world. And on the left, the high yield index as a result of having a spread to the treasury is sitting at the lowest levels ever. Got it. And so the, the high yield index, just to make sure I understand, this would be like high yield bonds or junk bonds? Right. This okay. Is the, so basically you're basically- The riskiest companies in the economy. You're, you're, what you're basically trying to tell me here is that we have all the negative yielding debt and then there's some type of spread on top of them for which uh, things like, like risky corporate bonds should trade at some type of premium. but because the negative yielding debt has gone so low, it's pushed everything else lower alongside it. Right, so junk bonds are trading where treasuries traded six, seven years ago. And it's actually spreading into the corporate debt market. So in, in Europe, for example, 41% um, of investment grade bonds, so these are still, they're not junk bonds, they're investment grade, but they're still bonds of actual companies and 41 percent of them actually have a nominal negative yield which is insane to me to think about but so who who the hell is buying that for the corporate bonds is that just all the treasury buying it or are there actually any institutions no, so, so, so it's gotten to the point where the government bonds are so low there are mandates out there for pensions and for banks and for other large institutional buyers, or for example, there's a 60-40 mandate portfolio still run that way and they have to own it, plus central banks own it. So it's, it's a combination. So you and I both know that, uh, that, a, that a negative yielding bond like that is definitely not a recipe for, uh, for a good return. What, what, what would it require to change the charter and how difficult would that be if somebody decided they no longer wanted to play in that game anymore? That's kind of one of the reasons we're talking about alternative assets, right? They're, we're literally not left with any viable options besides that, because there's virtually no other way of getting income the traditional route. 
Okay, got it. Um, here to the left, you can see now um, that for the first time ever in all of history, the real US investment grade yield. So again, we're talking about US investment grade bonds has actually hit negative. So there's a difference between nominal yield and the real yield. The real yield is once you account for inflation, which is the CPI, which you know, we all know is not necessarily that accurate. But even if you take the, the, the CPI numbers, the real yield is now negative, while the duration is actually at the highest. So nine years is now the average duration. So you have to lock your money up for nine years and you're still not keeping up with inflation. You're actually net negative. This is the first time that happened in US history. And when you're looking at here to the right, more than about 30% or 25 to 30% of US investment grade bonds actually have a negative yield of half a percent or more. Got it. Now it leads us to the next question. How much did the big four central banks, now we're talking about the Fed, the ECB, the BOE, and the BOJ, spend every 60 minutes buying financial assets known as the QE quantitative easing programs between March and November this year? How much money was digitally created, like Jay Powell said in his uh, 60 minutes interview, we print money digitally. How much digital money printing happened every hour between March and November 2020? Itai, are you ready for a little bit of feedback? I think everybody has caught on pretty early that a lot of your answers are D. So I'm going to go with D right now. And if we're doing, if it happens to be correct, we might have to switch up some of your answers in the future. Okay. I think he should throw in there. How many people drown correlated the, to the number of movies Nicholas Cage stars in? That's a beautiful chart that I've seen. Yeah. It's correlation. The answer is C is C. Is it? Your guess on my part. Wow. Wow. Just when you think you, you, you. Nice, you... nice poker face, Itai. <laughs> $1.4 4 billion per hour. Um, so look at what happened during COVID here. Um, balance sheet in December of 2019, 16.5 trillion over 25 trillion. And this is the trajectory right now, uh, an increase expected in under two years of 29 percent of GDP. The difference between 0809, 7 percent to GDP, where here they've gone total mon monetary uh, MMT. I wish I just got one hour of that QE programs into my bank account. Don't worry, maybe you'll get your chance because I think your next question might be about a, a, a new Federal Reserve chair. Well, who in 2017 said that would I say there would never ever be another financial crisis? Probably that would be going too far, but I do think we're much safer and I hope that it will not be in our lifetime and I don't believe that it will be. Is it Jay Powell, Christine Lagarde, Janet Yellen, or Steve Mnuchin? Right now it's looking like Itai, the options are gonna be, it's either gonna be, it's gonna either be our, our, our buddy Jay Powell or it's gonna be, our new friend, Janet Yellen. Who's, who's it gonna be? Who's it gonna be? It's our new secretary of the treasury. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're killing me, Itai. I wanted to have a little fun today, you know, a little deviation from the norm. It reminded me that a very famous economist in 1929 said, said that we have established a permanent, permanently higher plateau. Famous last words. Well, when was this? I think in 2013. So that guy probably made a lot of money. Yeah, that guy, that guy was trying to give us a sign. You know, all we had to do is just follow the random guy on TV's sign and we could have been loaded. Instead, I'm here talking with markets about you when we could have just rode this appreciation wave and just been, been hodling till the end of time. Well, Yellen is known as one of the bigger doves out there. Um, her in the Treasury Department is uh, going to mean more, more of the same. So when you talk about a dove, not everybody knows what it is. They think it's usually a beautiful um, bird that flies and is released on celebratory occasions. But we all know that, that doves in the financial world mean something else. So you want to tell us what it is? 
Right. She kind of looks a little bit like a dove, right? Um, the idea of a dove versus a hawk is somebody who's lenient in um, in their in their monetary uh, attitude. So they'll be more pro QE. They'll be more pro low interest rates, and they'll be willing to let things go for a long, a more extended period of time. Where in a hawk would be more worried about inflation and would likely to want to raise interest rates at the first sign of it, etc. Janet is known as a pretty big dove. So, so which brings to the, which begs to ask the next question, which is, do any hawks still exist? And when did they all kind of die out? They pretty much gone extinct when uh, COVID hit, in my opinion. I thought that Jay Powell was a little bit of a hawk when he raised interest rates four times uh, in 2018 and had some quantitative tightening programs and all that. But that all died away um, this year, for sure. Cool. Everybody, real quick, we're just going to take a quick pause. Just thumbs up. How's the how's the pace going so far? Thumbs up if it's okay. Thumbs down if you if you don't like us. I only th see thumbs up. This is great. Okay, Itai, continue. During the vicious financial market crash of March 2020, only one of the following was a safe haven that actually rose in value. Which one was it? Was it gold? Was it cash in the form of USD fiat? Was it bonds in the form of the 10 year treasury or was it Bitcoin? What time horizon, just cause I know you like to sometimes ask them to sleep. Just, just March. Only in March. When markets were actually crashing, like they were ten, there were limit downs, they halted trading. There was 10% down days in the S and P, et cetera. I think, uh, I think, I think, uh, I think our poker players are onto something. They figured it out. All right. All right, Itai. Hit him with it. It is the dollar. Dollar index was the only asset up 7%. Treasuries were down. Gold was down 10%. And Bitcoin was down 38%. So this begs to ask the question for everybody here, why in a major, major sell-off like that for a short period of time does the dollar rise? So a lot of it actually had to do with a massive US dollar margin call that was hitting... Uh, hitting portfolios that were borrowing in US dollar. And as that was happening, they were liquidating. It was a, it was a $2 trillion margin call, I believe, that was hitting the markets simultaneously. And there was a massive liquidation waves. So I think people need to understand that nobody owns assets in, in isolation to other assets. And in your portfolio, you may own gold, you may own Bitcoin, you may own stocks. And if you're getting a massive margin call on your S&P portfolio, um, you're probably going to sell whatever you can in order to get liquidity and pay off the margin call, which is why you're seeing correlation of publicly traded assets in general during crisis. So, and so now interest rates are down even further. So is it safe to say that the next time that there's a big drawdown, there could even be a bigger margin call that happens because there's more people on, on, on the margin? Yeah, potentially. I mean, the, 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 the more you increase leverage, speculation, and speculative position, the more likely you are to, to get those conditions, whatever the next crisis hits. So it's kind of like you're not really, by throwing money at the problem, you're not actually solving the problem. You're probably creating a bigger problem down the road. Got it. And then I'm just going to, just for everybody else here, a lot of people are going to say, okay, Itai, I understand that for a month period of time. But if you truly feel that central banks are printing more money than they actually need to, and you wanna hedge long-term against it, what historically has been a better hedge against that, gold or Bitcoin, and what's your take? Well, the problem is that Bitcoin doesn't have the history. So recently it's definitely been Bitcoin, but you know, gold has a 5,000 year history as actually being money. So it's, it's, it's a little bit difficult to answer that question is, is Bitcoin a true inflation hedge or is Bitcoin um, something else. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Something else. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. And, you know, we will probably find out in a few years. Peter, Peter Schiff, I forget who it was. Uh, somebody on my Twitter feed was making a strong argument that uh, Bitcoin was not the, the, uh, the hedge against money printing and that gold is a much better one. And I think that goes back to one of our previous calls. So maybe at some point we'll need to do that again. Indeed. Just remember Bitcoin's had like, multiple 70% drawdowns to its history. Correct. Mm -hmm. We are aware.
So which of the following asset class had the largest inflow of money as a percentage of its managed AUM? Is it gold? Is it cash? Is it bonds or is it equities? I'm getting a lot of D's. D All right. D's. The answer may surprise you, it's gold. Gold had $53 billion come in, which is actually 23% of its managed AUM. Cash had 858 billion, which is 16%. Bonds, 360 billion, which is 5%. Equities only had a 1.2% increase, which is just 173 billion. Why did equities go up that much then? Everybody is uh, speculating. That is a great question. There's a lot of factors out there and sometimes it's enough to get just a marginal buyer in order to push prices much higher. But there's a lot more things at play such as options that push prices, uh, short covering, et cetera. And we actually had a very famous gamma squeeze to the upside happening in three different occasions this year um, and a lot of retail activity that's more short term. So things have been pushed a lot more um, than they would have otherwise. And, and SoftBank had to do with, with some of those events that happened during the year. And Itai, for, for the humans on this call that don't know what gamma means, can you uh, try to explain that in more of like a, a layperson term so that we can actually follow along and not our heads to what you say? Yeah, so the main, the main idea is that if you buy a lot of call options, you can potentially create a feedback loop where market makers are going to have to buy stock contracts in order to hedge that exposure and create a positive feedback loop on the market with potentially very little money to comparatively to initiate that, that loop. And that's what happened this year uh, on a few different occasions. Didn't do anything for me. Okay, next one. Okay. Rob, do you want to try a, a, a better explanation for that? Very quickly, uh, an options delta will tell you how much the option will move based upon a move in the underlying. So if an option has as options a dollar and has a delta of 50, or 50%, that means a dollar move in the underlying will move the option 50 cents. The Makes gamma sense. tells you how much the delta will change. So if the, if the gamma is like 10 cents, that means a dollar underlying move in the, the move, a dollar move in the underlying, let's say stock, will cause a 10 cent change or 10% change in the delta. So the delta will go from 50 to 60. So it's a mathematical measurement. And as options start getting towards their expiry, their gammas start going crazy. Okay. So in, in theater, they have an understudy. I think the understudy might have replaced the master. Uh, Rob, we'll talk, about your, we'll talk about your Monday night contract um, at the end of this call, okay? Nice job. Thank you. I'll play for the Redskins. Okay. Um, in the Washington so football team? Money market, mar money market funds held by institutions actually had a massive increase in cash. Uh, around March time, as could be expected. And then into the middle part of 2020, almost all that cash was deployed and the amount of cash actually ended up lower than prior years. And what's interesting is we're seeing evidence of the so-called K-shaped recovery, um, where you know that was a rate of change chart. This chart in blue actually shows the amount of assets held uh, or the amount of cash held in money market accounts by institutions and large deposits here in blue. And we can see that the amount actually increased and that big injection into the markets was this little drop right there. But small time deposit, this is the small investors, mom and pop, whatever, uh, holdings and money market funds. 2020 was uh, devastating for them. There's been a multi-decade trend of declining amount of money in those money markets anyways. And in 2020, um, there was a massive acceleration to the downside. Basically, they had to probably empty up those accounts just to stay alive, which is um, quite sad. So this is the this right here is the wealth gap that we're seeing and that we hear about every day. Right, and 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 COVID basically helped the big get even bigger. And going into a little bit of consumer spending, according to aggregated. B of A credit card and debit card data, 
What category is seeing the largest increase in consumer spending? Is it furniture, home improvement, online electronics, or grocery, toilet paper included? Actually, Everything. I don't even know if it could be toilet paper because toilet paper was completely non-existent for a long period of time. It was. That's why it was sold so well. You're yeah. so full of crap. <laughs> Oh boy, Andy comes in with the best dad joke of the night. I love it. All right, answer is online electronics up 105%. But let's go into consumer spending a little bit. Here in the blue chart to the right, we see consumer spending or um, yeah, it's consumer sales besides auto and gas stations. If you take those out, We've actually made a new all-time high in November. That was that COVID break and an immediate V-shaped recovery. Now, you would find that over the long term, this chart is pretty correlated with the S&P 500. So when you see new highs made on this chart, it's not a surprise that, it's not a surprise that the S&P 500 made a new high as well. But Another thing that came into that was people getting the two thousand dollar, getting you know, getting the twelve hundred dollar checks. I know a ton of them that went out either bought weed or bought electronics or both. It's a good data point. Um, to the left, food food services have actually recovered almost sixty percent of their drop, but they're still far below where they were pre-COVID, which makes sense. Um, so thinking about industries that are going to recover in twenty twenty one, that one definitely comes to mind. Quick, quick question. I know one of the biggest concerns with, with um, the stimulus packages was if too much money gets down to the, the average person, would it lead to actual asset price inflation? Did we see any asset price inflation in the electronics category? So I think when you're talking about, you're talking about CPI inflation, asset class inflation, we've definitely seen it. That, S&P 500. For sure. And the assets I'm talking about for just specifically like electronics and consumer goods, because I know that everybody's concerned about all these central banks are concerned about um, inflation for the everyday items. So we've actually seen deflation um, in those in those categories, because as they improve, their price has normally gone down. This is actually one of the only categories where it actually did not increase and actually decrease. So think about a TV 20, 25 years ago and think about a TV today on a relative basis, cheaper today by far. Okay, so then the answer is no? The answer is no about electronic. Okay, and as Larry is saying, Larry, tell us about technology. Well, I typed that in before Ite said it, but he's right. I mean, just, I was in Costco yesterday and now they're selling me 80 inch TVs for what I paid for a 60 inch TV two years ago actually they're selling them for less so and you know they just don't go up what's it it's cheaper yeah. to manufacture and you know it's just it's very competitive market etc well and as we learn in economics the only things that increase productivity are more people and better technology and the people it's all has to get more resources to fill them but this technology is the thing that actually makes it richer Good comment. Well said. Cool. Itai, keep going. Okay, we're getting into the fun part. U.S. federal government is on course to spend $7 trillion in 2020. What is the current level of U.S. national debt per citizen in this country? 23,000, 43,000, 63,000, or 83,000? And the answer is D, $83,000 per citizen. Let's look, at the, let's look at the numbers. This is the cumulative budget deficit every year here marked at a different color, 2011 through 2021. This is 2020 compared to all other years. And the budget deficit is just blown out of proportion. We're already starting the year with the biggest budget deficit on record for this time of year. 
That's crazy. So this has monster implications for the future of our country. Right. Let's dig into the numbers a little bit. Um, here is the surplus deficit for October 2020. Well, I think they can might as well just scrap the surplus here. I don't think that, that will happen again. Um, you can see that the total, total receipts of $238 billion, total outlets of $522 billion for a deficit of $284 billion. I know right now there's a lot of discussion over the Biden tax plan of increasing uh, corporate tax uh, from 21, I believe, to 28%. Notice here, corporate income tax is just $9 billion. So you're literally talking about completely immaterial changes um, when it comes to that. And you can see the different, the different spending options right there. What really um, attracts my attention is the net interest. So notice, we're actually spending $32 billion to pay interest on that amount of debt, on that amount of deficit. And that is roughly 13.5% of the total income. Now, we are having the lowest interest rate period in all of history. And the one year, uh, the 10 year treasury is averaging around 1%. What will happen if the 10 year treasury will be approximately 3%? Can you let Alex Green answer this one? I know he's dying. He's dying to get engaged with everybody. Alex, you want to do it? It's sort of like a nuclear bomb. It's a nuclear bomb because now all of a sudden a, a rise to 3% literally triples the net interest. And now we're paying just as much on Medicare as we are paying on interest for our debt. So 96 billion potentially only goes to net interest when we're collecting $238 billion total. I liked how Alex was playing very sad violin music in the background as he gave that answer, kind of like the young Frankenstein. Yeah, what, what the heck happens at your house on a Monday night? Jeez, that is depressing. Hey, That's Kevin. what happens when you got two kids. <laughs> hey, see, they're playing the theme from Schindler's <laughs> List. We're saying all this is what they're doing. Which is why, which is why interest rates can't, simply cannot rise. So... So and this is just October, and that was just October. You're not even talking about year. You're just talking about October, correct? Yeah, I'm just looking at the most recent data I could yeah. find. So, but so at the same time, I just, I just want to call it out because these guys said it very casually. But I think this is literally one of the biggest things that sticks in my mind right now, which is that the government cannot afford to allow interest rates to rise. That would be totally catastrophic for them. So they have all the incentive to keep interest rates low. So if interest rates are being kept low, where does income come from when bonds were supposed to yield it? You know, this really, I think, has major implications on an investing portfolio. And I just want everybody to understand that when the government sees that, they do not want that number creeping up. They're going to do whatever they can to keep it low until they can't. And you can see here net interest paid by the U.S. federal government. So the government has actually never paid less for debt ever. So they're able to- they're At an able, interest rate level, correct? Correct. So they're able to come, come away with spending $7 trillion and bringing in $3 trillion in taxes and basically get away with it for now. And you have to ask yourself the question, does this put the dollar standard itself at risk? So one of the reasons the US is able to do that and other countries can't, you know, some Latin American countries have tried to create their own currency and pay for a bunch of stuff. Some examples come to mind that I won't bring up. And they've always failed. Why can the US succeed? The US can succeed because in 1944 in Bretton Woods, there was an agreement where the winners of World War II basically set up a standard that's known as the dollar standard. Um, it was backed by gold originally until Nixon took it out in 1971. But nonetheless, when a person from Mongolia and a person from Indonesia want to trade with each other, what currency did they use? The US dollar. When somebody from Germany wants to buy some merchandise from Egypt, some nice Egyptian cotton, what does he pay with? The new Israeli shekel. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> no, it's the dollar. It's the dollar. Oh. And, 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 and the whole point is like the US can afford to do what it wants because there's a huge global demand for dollars as a result of trade and other things that are related to it. So there is external demand for that US dollar. That's usually comes 
um, that usually gets parked in US treasuries by foreign central banks. And that's how they keep their reserves because they do want to get some interest for it, even if it's 1%. And here to the right, you see the US treasuries held by foreign central banks. That seems like it's been a consistent number. It hasn't really changed. But you can see that on the left side, because there's just been so much issuance of treasuries, because when the Fed creates money out of thin air, it buys US treasuries. So the treasury creates it on one hand, the Fed creates money on the other hand, and then that new money goes in and buys treasuries. So as a percentage of the total US treasury debt in 09, and even as recent as 2011, foreign banks and foreign central banks as foreign reserves held about 30% of all US treasuries, but now they only hold 16%, not because they have less, but because we've created so much of it. And you have to ask yourself, at what point did they stop? That's the question I want to know. So what happens when China says, I'm done with this, I don't want to be converting into USD? That will have massive implications on our monetary and fiscal systems, because we will simply not have the option of creating as much money as we did before simply because there will be a lot less demand for it. So the risk of real inflation and hyperinflation would be as present as it's been in other countries. So let me make sure I'm tying these concepts together because I want to understand how this world works. China says, no more USD. I'm going to go direct. Then all of a sudden there's a risk of real-time inflation here. When real-time inflation hits, then all of a sudden the only option that the government has to raise interest rates they raise interest rates now that now the amount of money that they spend on the debt has to go way up, which could cause a full on crisis. That's how we could see our interest rate spike, which, which would, cause, which would cause a debt haircut, as you've seen in countries like Greece and other countries that have gone through that and simply just defaulted on their debt. But, you know, that would be a nuclear bomb. So well, there's so a fine line of what you could do. And so Chris brought up a really good point here, which I don't know if any people tie together. But there's also this tie-in of like our, our, the amount of spending we have on our military and the big focus on the military and, and the tie-in with that and the United States as a reserve currency of the world. Do you have any kind of just eat high it's thoughts? A known, it's a known thing. One of the main, I mean, it's kind of like a hidden conspiracy theory, but one of the reasons America keeps such a, long, a strong military, spends more than all the other countries of the world combine is to pretty much coerce the world to maintain the dollar standard. That's, that's the main reasoning in my, in my opinion. So maybe we get off the dollar standard, then we can cut back on this military spending a little bit, and then we just trade debt payments for, for military spend. Well, it's more, it's more about like, oh, you wanna get off the dollar standard? Well, we may bomb you. Interesting. For, we'll continue this part in our after convo. Once our after convo. The slides, continue. That gets, that gets a little too too intense here. Um, okay, some fun trivia here. Excluding the US stock market, the current level of global equities, so it's the MSCI, ACWI, is currently how far from the multi-year October 2007 peak? Is it 25% higher, 10% higher, same level, or 5% lower? I see a variety of answers here. And the answer is, it is in fact lower. If wow. you exclude the US stock market, the global stock markets are actually have done, have been in a lost decade and have actually done nothing for over 13 years with very volatile up and downs. So they've had big up and downs and then they've also seen, this is just from nominal highs, correct? Correct. This, this doesn't, doesn't factor inflation. in all the printing that's happened as well. So the losses have actually, real losses have probably been a lot bigger. So a lot of people tell me, you know, equities are the answer. Equities are the answer. They always go up. They always go up. But this is an example that if you didn't invest in the U.S. stock market, you have actually lost money over a very extended period of time. And you've suffered through extensive volatility. And there has been periods in history where the U.S. stock market itself has gone through that time. So it's just keep in mind that you can't assume that returns are always going to come based on um, on one return driver. Didn't we from the dot, dot com boom but bust for like 15 years? We were basically flat from 2000 to 2015. I think it was to 2013, but almost, yeah, about yeah. 13 years. 
Right. So, so you basically have to have, so you're basically arguing that, hey, even if you're an equity investor, you have internationally, you have to have diversification because if you missed out in the US, you were just, you were just shit out of luck. That's right. So for example, if you invested in the French stock market, that's also has done nothing for 20 years. Uh, they are too busy smoking and uh, enjoying the good cheese. It's okay. I, I'm, I'm a Francophile. It's fine. A big part of it here to the right is actually US dollar index versus the local currencies. The US dollar was strong, so it kind of um, hurt their returns. To the left, this is kind of interesting. Now you include the US. This is global stocks in uh, red. These are what we called valuation bands. Um, and you can see where the market should be based on what multiple. Here's a 14 multiple, 12 multiple, 10, 16 multiple. Um, it's virtually off the chart. Valuations right now are fairly high, which brings me to the next one. Best return theme in 2020. Is it crypto, solar, CRISPR, CRISPR technology, or carbon? We gotta, we gotta show some love to crypto here. It's gotta be, right? I see A, 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 A. It is A. But believe it or not, solar almost did just as good at 202%. And CRISPR was up 145%. And I wanted to share a little chart. I, I, you know, Bitcoin people don't, don't kill me for showing this. Um, here in red, you see Bitcoin compared to historical bubbles, Tulip Mania, Mississippi bubble, South Sea bubble, tech bubble, financial stocks, um, Japanese stocks, et cetera. Bitcoin, this was the first boom and bust of Bitcoin. I believe here it went and peaked at uh, 20,000 or so. All the other bubbles have kind of went to nothing and Bitcoin came back and made everything else look like nothing, which is pretty incredible. And if you're assuming the 2021 for Bitcoin is going to be the same as 2020 was. The only issue with that is if it does end up being that way, the market cap of Bitcoin will actually be bigger than the total US dollars in circulation that are not treasuries or debt. So Bernard brought up a good point, which is maybe we shouldn't be looking at it as just um, Bitcoin, but maybe as like a basket of crypto assets. I'm just not sure, you know, how much that, that changes it. Well, if you're looking at just a basket of crypto assets, it will actually make it there faster because there will be more, there will be more, no, there will be more pool of market cap in there. Um, so even though the dollar in circulation is growing very, very rapidly, the growth of Bitcoin is pretty much insane. I mean, when you're talking about doubling in a single month, um, the growth trajectory is just something that, um, Bitcoin may be completely real and is going to sustain as even a replacement for money. Uh, just, you know, I'm a little worried when things just go up too, too, too quickly. Got it. Cool. Okay. Now we're going a little bit into the SPAC mania. Um, how much money was raised in SPACs in 2020? Okay, the answer is D, just because everybody knows that I like D's more than other letters. Oh boy. All we're right. Gonna, we're gonna have to just next time, what you can do is you can go into Excel and you can do columns one through 10 and then do a random number generator. And then we'll do that, okay? So that way we can actually give a little bit of variation in there. Let's do that. Even though, no, there are some other ones in there too. Um, so. In 2020, 82 billion um, IPO through SPACs, which is more than 10 years combined. Now, I've noticed that SPACs is a little bit of a, of a sign when there's over speculation in the market. You can see in 2007, for example, that's when um, SPACs peaked up. And then um, in 2009, during the crisis, there was just a single SPAC. There's been 248 this year. So a little bit of background. SPAC is a special purpose acquisition uh, company. 
it's basically a shell company that is just created to raise capital um, with the sole intention of just buying some kind of private company and then taking it public uh, as a way to kind of bypass the traditional IPO process. It's a way to take a private company public very, very quick. So this year, you can see that the average um, deal size was pretty large, 334 million, and there was way more SPACs than, than normal. Um, which leads us to the next part, which is the IPO frenzy. So new shared IPOs in 2020 actually rallied the most on the first day of issuance than any other time since the dot-com bubble. So the average um, first day IPO trading has had a 40% gain. And again, we haven't seen that since 2000, 1999. So the play here, Itai, is get pre, this is why people want pre-IPO shares so badly, because even since 1980, there's never been a single down year where people made money on day one. So get your pre-IPO shares, sell on day one, lock your profits, call it a day. That's actually a very common high net, high net worth and ultra high net worth uh, uh, investment strategy. Usually accounts, people that have over 25 million and have a relationship with different banks, they get those pre shares and they get to do that, but it's not a viable option for a retail investor. So are we, are we hearing about the future of equilibrium partners here? Well, this could be one of the trading mechanisms because if equilibrium operates as one pool of capital, we theoretically could push our way in. That's what it sounded like to me, Rob. Yeah, yeah trust me when I say we're already exploring how we can get allocations on pre-IPO stock and large secondaries. The conversations are already in flight, don't you worry. My brother-in-law has a washer terrier he wants to talk to you all about. A what? A washer terrier. A washer terrier. Pre-IPO. It's pre-IPO, he tells me. Ah, okay. There we go. As long as you say the keyword pre-IPO, our ears are all our ears are all up. Hey, it doesn't take much to go IPO nowadays. Is it, pre, uh, is it a pre-IPO SPAC? Because that would just I don't even know what that is, but I'm all about it. It doesn't take much to go IPO nowadays with um, average e-broker daily average trades nowadays with Robinhood um, is just exploded, and it makes the dot-com boom look like absolutely nothing as far as the amount of retail trading that's going on. And let's talk about those IPOs. About 80% of all IPOs this past year had negative income. Just let that sink in for just one second. This just doesn't, this doesn't surprise me because when you see how every Silicon Valley company operates, uh, this is just a reflection of that. And then you basically have a government now that's finally acting like the, the, the startups that are better, better pushing the equities higher. That's right. The U.S. government is, uh, is, is raising money from, uh, from investors to burn money in the hopes of making income at some point in the future. <laughs> Maybe this is the first smart thing they've done in a while. <laughs> So we've never actually had 80% uh, of new issuance uh, being losers. And you can see, for example, during the crisis, IPOs in 09 and 10 actually made money. Investors were really worried about, is this a profitable, solid company? It appears that nowadays they just don't care. And this is also reflected in call option uh, volume. Um, people are... One of, the, one of the things that ties to the beginning of the call is how come retail investors have done 14 times better than hedge funds? Well, if you are 25% of your portfolio is Tesla call options, that's how you do it. And no sane hedge fund in the world will do anything remotely close to that. So it's just been an overload of risk that is played, that is paid off that, that people are now feeling like what their genius is about until they get smacked and it's going to be bad. Look, if I go to the roulette table and I put $1,000 on red and I win three times in a row, doesn't make me, uh, doesn't make me a, a better performer than somebody who you know went to the blackjack table, for example, and bet much smaller amounts and 
won much, much smaller uh, amounts of money. I guess that's my gambling example to it. Not to offend any of the professional gamblers in our No, it's, it's, it is interesting though, because you know we do come a lot across enough of these Silicon Valley people. And I was kind of thinking about this in the shower today is that a lot of what makes these entrepreneurs really great is that they sit around and they have a thesis about what's gonna happen in the world. And then they kind of start a business to attack a segment that's underserved. And they kind of apply that same thinking to their stocks, but without an understanding of how the entire world is kind of like come, come together. And they think, oh yeah, of course this makes total sense, but don't understand that, you know, there's, you know, you know, uh, um, there, there's, there's, there, there's all types of other things happening out there. So I don't know, it's just interesting to kind of see that play out. And I'm just curious, you know, how that'll be a year or two years from now. So think about it this way. The guy at the hedge fund is thinking to himself, I'm going to put this trade on, but I'm going to do it in a way that I'm still here next week, next month, and next year. The guy, the retail guy comes in and is like, well, I'm going to put this option on and I really think Tesla is going to go up, but he doesn't have the risk management to understand that if it doesn't, he's actually not going to be here next week or maybe not next month. So, you know, in a year where everything goes up and everything goes according to plan, yeah, you'll see this massive outperformance of retail investors, no doubt. Makes sense. And lastly, a bonus question before we end. Where were people moving during 2020? The biggest net gainer state. Is it Florida, oh. California? Yeah, this is, this is easy. The Arizona? biggest net gainer is the, the, Cesar, Chavez, the Cesar Chavez sidewalk between Congress and First Street. <laughs> In Austin, Texas. You should have said where are the most needles located. So no, that we, would be no, that would be Rob, Austin. Rob, that's that one's not even a, that one's not even a debate. That is a California issue all over the place. Okay. Answer Texas by far. So Texas gained how many total? You can't just say that and then show a graph. Almost, it's gained. almost about, it's almost 400,000 uh, mm -hmm. people that have moved. Well, what about percentage though? Well, as percentage of the population, it's like one and a half -ish percent, uh, something, something like that. There's about 30 million people here, maybe a percent and a quarter. Florida is number two, um, followed by Arizona, North Carolina, and Georgia. Biggest loser, New York, not a surprise, Illinois, and California. I'm so not surprised by Illinois. I like, I know we've, I'm, I'm from there, but man, it's just every other day is another person I know that's leaving. They are getting out of there as fast as they can. Sad. Sad. All right, guys, that's all I got. Hope, hope you enjoyed it.